الله الذي أنزل على هذه الكتاب ولم يجعله عوجا والحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفر ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا ومن يهدي الله تعالى فلا مذل له ومن يذل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق دقاته ولا تموتون إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وكونوا مع الصادقين يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وكونوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يتع لها ورسوله فقد فاد فوضا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصلح الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحديث حديث محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عزة من لساني يفقه قولي عما بعد Indeed, all praises for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We seek His guidance, we seek His forgiveness, we put our reliance and our faith upon Him, and we seek refuge in Allah from the evil consequences of our actions. Whomsoever Allah has guided, then there is none to mislead Him. And whomsoever Allah has allowed to go astray, then there is no one to guide this person. And we bear witness and we testify that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah, and that Muhammad, the son of Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is His slave and His messenger. I remind myself as I remind you, as I begin, that you and I are tied in a covenant between ourselves and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that every word that I am saying is being recorded by the angels, and I will be asked about on the Day of Judgment. And also, likewise, the, every word that you are listening to is being recorded by the angels, and you too will be asked about on the Day of Judgment. In the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu we find that in the first 13 years, the first 13 years in Mecca, the da'wah was on the down low. It was done in a secretive manner. And there was a lot of torture and persecution that the Muslims went through at that time. And when they traveled over to Medina, it was the first time that they were able to partake in some comfort. They had some comfort in Medina because the Ansar, their hospitality, was nothing like they had seen before. They came from 13 years of torture and persecution by their own people, and now they had traveled over to Medina and they were finally feeling some comfort for the first time in 13 years. And at this time, when the Prophet وسلم, he was with some of his companions, at this time one of the ayat that was revealed by the Audu Billahi Min Shaitan Rajim, Adam Yahnili Ladina Amanu and Daksha Kulu Huli Dikri La Wama Nazana bin al Haki wa Laya Kunu Kaladina Kutu al Kitala bin Kabu Fatala Alihi Mul Amadu Fatasat Kulu Buhum wa Kathiru min Hum Fasibun. The Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said that has the time not come for the believers to be humble, for their hearts to be humble, in that which has been revealed to them, meaning of the truth, meaning the Qur'an. Because there were many that came before them and they were given books as well, but they left that. And for many of them are the evil transgressors. And the Sahabi, when this, the Asbab, when this came down, he said that for the first time, we finally were feeling some comfort. And I came to know my state with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we were in the state of ghafla, we were in the state of heedlessness. This is not a normal person that's saying this. Keep in mind, this is a companion of the Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam. He said that we were in a state of ghafla, and when this verse came down, it was like a pinch, and it woke me up. And so this is a companion that is living Amongst the Prophet he's seeing the verses being revealed to the Prophet He's seeing all the miracles that the Nabi is doing. And so he is a live testimony. And even then, he's saying that I slacked off. I put my, you know, I didn't bring my A game. I slacked off and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminded us with this verse to come back. And so now we, we are here today right, in Ramadan. And every believer, for them, is an opportunity to again be waken up, right, and attach, detach, rather, from all of the physical 
of this world, of this dunya, and finally go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what you were actually created for. And you have not been created jinn or man, except that you worship him. Now you are going back to your actual purpose. Not only is he merciful enough to allow you to exist, not only is he merciful enough for you to breathe from one second to the next, but he has also given you a purpose. And that is huge, because every single human being on this planet, at one point or another in their lifetime, thinks about why was I created, why was I put here, and what is my actual purpose. So one of the ayat that is often quoted as we lead into Ramadan is the oft recited verse from Surah Al-Baqarah. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ السِّيَانُ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْتَقُونَ O oh, you who believe, fasting is prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those that came before you so that you may become what? God conscious. So that you may have taqwa. And so the topic of this is the attributes of the people of taqwa. Because we are moving towards some change. That's the whole point of Ramadan. You are shedding a, a, a shell that you had, you're shedding some skin that you had, like a snake sheds skin and he grows new skin. That's exactly what we're doing. Whatever we had in the past, in 2011 and 2012, and what we brought with us, we are leaving that behind. We're saying we're closing the doors on that, and inshallah we're moving towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we're continuing on this journey. And so, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Ali Imran, He says, اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولُ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ so this is where he starts these ayat, and he says that you must obey Allah and His Messenger if you want to have His mercy. So what he's telling us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is that if you, have, if you are hopeful for His mercy, and this is the month of mercy, if you are hopeful, the number one thing you have to do is we have to change our attitude towards Allah and His Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We have to change our attitude to what Allah has set forth and what the Prophet ﷺ has brought to us, we have to change our attitude if we are people that are hopeful for that mercy. And then he says, Rush, race towards the forgiveness of your Lord. Rush and race towards the forgiveness of your Lord. You don't race, you don't run towards anything that you do not need. If you need something, that's when you run towards it. You, normally, you would just walk towards it. You wouldn't exert any extra energy to go to it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that these people, these people that carry taqwa, they race, they want to race towards the forgiveness of their Lord. Right? You don't jump into the carpool lane on the New Jersey Turnpike unless you want to show up at, you know, on time at work because you need to get to work. You need to get to work. You don't rush to the bathroom unless you need to get to the bathroom. You don't rush to catch the train unless you know that it's going to leave at 7.15 and uh oh, it's already 7.14 and I'm still a half mile away. You won't rush because it's, you realize that the need is there. And so Allah is saying that this mercy and this forgiveness, you need it. You need it and I need it because maybe right now you don't see it because of the delusion of this world. But when all of this taken away, and we stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's just us and our Creator, then we have some very difficult questions to answer. And we're going to need that mercy, and we're going to need that, uh, that forgiveness. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that what, what is waiting for you is this Jannah. Right? And this is what's so unique about this place in the Qur'an, in Surah Al-Imran, and, and the Shaykh will probably recite this in another day or two. This is what's so unique. Allah starts this with Jannah, and He ends it with Jannah. And in the middle are these muttaqeen. In the middle are these people that are God conscious. So, SubhanAllah, I want to know who these people are. Right? Because if Jannah is the beginning and Jannah is the end, I want to know who they are. If I go into an institution, into a public high school, into a college, and I see a deans list or an honor rolls list, and I see some names on there, and I'm a member of that institution, I automatically want to know, how did these people get on here? What did they do? Did they study hard? Did they stay up late? Did they come to class early? Did they leave late? Did they ask the professor questions? I want to know all of those things, so that I can do those things, so that one day, inshallah, I can be on that list as well. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says that, he starts with Jannah, and he says that this Jannah, this real estate, right, is the expense of the heavens and the earth. 
And you may not get it if you're young right now, but if you're married, or if you've traded houses, and you've traded up, you understand what this means extremely well. When I was in college at Rutgers University, there was five of us living in a two-bedroom apartment. I slept in the dining room. Figure that out, right? We made the dining room into a bedroom. But then as you grow, right, and you get married, your wife is not gonna wanna sleep in the dining room with you, so you get a condominium or you get a townhouse, right? You need a bigger place. And then as you get a family, you realize that you need a bigger house. And you see somebody else and you start to think because man is never satisfied. So you say, oh, our backyard is not big enough or our house is not big enough. So we need to now move up again. We need to upgrade. We need to start thinking about the future. We need to start looking into the school. We need a blue ribbon school for our children to go to. We need a good Islamic school for our children to go to. Let's move to that neighborhood. We start thinking and we are completely unstable in this life. We are constantly wanting to move and upgrade and trade up. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, this is your final abode, and the, the real estate is so expensive that you will never want anything more, subhanAllah. That this is your final, this is your final final, right? This palace, this, this land that you're going to be given, as far as you can see, this is all yours. It's got your name on it. So don't worry, this is a stable living, this is a stable life, this is the best life, this is what's offered to you. Who is it prepared for? It's prepared for what we said earlier, right? Who is supposed to fast? The muttaqeen, so that you may become what? God conscious, right? This is prepared for those God conscious. What do they do? What do these people do? What do they look like? How do I even know that I may possibly one day be from, one, uh, from amongst them? They spend in the good times and in the bad times. They spend in the good times and in the bad times. What are these people spending? They're spending their time, they're spending their wealth, they're investing in that real estate that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is selling you. Right? They're investing in that. There's no brochures, there's no sales pieces to look at, there's no pictures to look at. You're trusting the one that's selling it to you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any salesperson that tries to sell you anything in this world and they don't show you the product, you say, I don't trust you. I need to see it to believe it. Right? But Allah is selling you this and He's saying that in the good times and in the bad times, you must be striving towards Him. So last year, the United States, right, the, their credit rating was downgraded. And there was panic and pandemonium in the economic markets and people were saying, what's going to happen with my stocks and all of this stuff, right? And regardless of that, the Muslims, they continued to donate. They continued to give because we have this belief. We come from a different vantage point. We think, because the Prophet ﷺ told us with his truthful tongue that was commissioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he told us that when you spend in the way of Allah, Allah gives it back to you and He gives it back to you in multiple fold. So we're not worried about that. It's already written for us. It was written for us when we were in the wombs of our mothers and the angel came and wrote those four things. One of them was our risk. So we're not even worried about that. But here's the beautiful part about this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't say amwal. He doesn't say your wealth. So if you are young or if you are old, or if you have money or you don't have money, Allah is not saying you're well. He's talking about your youth. He's talking about your priorities. He's talking about your planning. He's talking about all of these things. He's talking about these things are the things that you need to sacrifice if you wish to draw closer to your Lord and if you want to be on that list. If you want to be on that list. These people, they swallow their anger. They swallow their anger. And you may come you know, next to somebody that says something to you. You may listen to Fox News and somebody is saying something and you have the right to be angry. You may be speaking with your mother and the Quran says don't even say of, alif and fa. Don't even say of, two letters, right? Two huruf. You can't even say that. And what do we end up doing? We end up saying sentences and paragraphs and essays back to our mothers, right? And so Allah is saying, swallow your anger. What does that mean? When I put an apple in my mouth, you see my cheek starts to protrude a little bit, right? But when it enters my digestive tract and it goes into my esophagus, you can no longer see that apple. And that's what Allah is saying. That not only can you not get angry, it can't even show on your face. It can't even show on your face. When you're talking to your loved ones, it can't even show on your face. You know, a lot of people, they have the audacity that when they start to become quote-unquote religious, and they start to move along the religious continuum. There was a sister, I was sitting in a class, she made this very, you know, nice observation. I think it's very keen. She said that 
you know, we knew this brother in our family, and he was so nice. He used to go out of his way and do things for people. Then he started going to the masjid, and he started to pray, and he became really religious. He grew a beard and everything. He became very religious. And he started to get meaner and meaner and meaner and meaner. And it's, it's to say something that, you know, when we are people, we are trying to be from, you know, the musallim, right? Why are people not smiling at the masjid, in the masjid? Why does the person on the right and the left not know who your, what your name is? When the Prophet wasallam, he said, Ashu salam right? He said, spread the salam. Why do we not know one another, right? Why does the Pakistani not talk to the Arab who doesn't talk to the African American? Why are we all just moving into silos within the same masjid, under the same roof, we're moving into silos? Right? Amongst ourselves. We're supposed to be one people. We're supposed to be one people. The Prophet wasallam, he was on the outside in the masjid as he was on the inside. They asked Hazrat Aisha, they interviewed her about this. They asked her, to, you know, tell us about it. And he said that he does the most menial things. You know, things that you would hire a janitor or a custodian to do, he does those things. He washes the dishes. He, you know, this is the man that's leader of the Islamic State. Right? This is the this is the uh, messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. These are the things that he does. He doesn't come home, sit on the couch, and say, "Massage my feet, you know, give me the biryani, give me the hummus, give me all of these things, and now, you know, let me relax because I've been out there working so hard for you and the children." He doesn't say that. No, he gets down and dirty. He rolls his sleeves up and he gets and starts doing these things. Same thing with teenagers, right? When teenagers are so quick. You know, and I, I was one of them. We're playing basketball, we're playing football. You get fouled, you get your shot blocked, and all of a sudden you want to exact revenge on that person now, right? You have to say something back because your ego has taken a hit. So you need to now retaliate, right? Your nuts, your lower self is saying, get him back. And Allah is saying something else. He's saying, go away from that. Soon as that happens, there should be a mechanism inside of your heart and inside of your mind that goes click, and it says, remember Allah wal kathimin al ghayb Because why? You want to be from that list. You want to be from al muttaqin Right? That's why you do it. You don't do it because the other person deserves it. Of course he wronged you. He doesn't deserve it. You do it because you want the love and the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wal afina and al nas Wallahu yuhibbu al And I'm going to wrap up inshaAllah in the next two, three minutes. Uh, the... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he continued, he said that these people then they love, uh, you know, they forgive out of love. And they exercise excellence in their deen. That's one of the other things that they do. And I'm going to fast forward because we're short on time. After all of these good things that the mutaqeen do, then Allah starts to talk about the bad things that they do. He starts to talk about the bad things that they do. And he subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Right? That these people, they are doing bad things. They're doing things that are lewd and they're doing things that are shameless. Right? He knows the fraud of your eyes. He knows the deception of the eyes. He knows that stealing gaze. He knows when you friended somebody on Facebook and you started looking at her picture. Or sisters, when you friended him on Facebook and started looking at his picture. It could be in the darkness of the night. And you're doing it while your parents are sleeping. But Allah sees it, and your angels see it, and they are recording it. And Allah knows all about it. And so He's saying that these muttaqeen, they do all of these good things, but they also do bad things. Yeah, they also do bad things. They also do bad things. And they also wrong their souls, is what Allah says next. They wrong their souls. So maybe they said something to a family member, or they didn't pay their zakah, or they forgot to wake up for fajr today. They wrong themselves. But what's the first thing that they do? They remember Allah. They remember Allah and they immediately turn back to Allah. It is a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He gives us time when we make a mistake, when we make a sin, that the angels don't record it right away. If they were to record it right away, we'd have books and books and books written against us. But Allah gives you that time to be from al muttaqin And I'll finish with this. One of the, uh, one of the people, he made an observation that you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as He finishes this, He says that, who else can you turn to but Allah? At the end of the day, who else can you turn to but Allah? With all of your bad deeds and all of the sins that you have done and all of these burdens that we carry, who else are you going to turn to but Allah? And He says, He made this observation in the middle of the mall and kids were, you know, people were going through the hallways and one particular girl, she was being yelled at by her mother, right? And the mom is yelling at her and she even, 
slapped her on the back of the head. And so this daughter of hers, she doesn't go and run into Macy's to the salesperson and say, please comfort me, please comfort me, my mama, she just hit me. She doesn't run into Foot Locker and starts talking to the salesperson over there or the cash register person over there, saying, comfort me, my mom just hit me. The same person who's giving her the punishment, the daughter is running back to the mom. Right? The mom yelled at her, and now she's running back to the mom and looking for her comfort. So regardless of the source of the punishment or the torture or the sin, right? Who else can we turn to but Allah? At the end of the day, we have nobody but Allah. Because at the end of the day, it will be you alone in your grave. At the end of the day, it will be you alone in, your, in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to answer those questions. So I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes us from those people that want to be from the muttaqeen, that strive to be from the muttaqeen. And if we don't have this quality in us, that we begin to start inculcating these qualities within us and we start to talk to our kids and our families about this. اللهم اجعلنا منهم اللهم اجعلنا من الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر واخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين جزاكم الله خير السلام عليكم